Good morning, brothers and sisters. So I hope that we have all come here this morning with great hope, and that hope is not on anything that we can see around us. It is the future glory that encourages us to keep us hopeful. And this morning we have Brother Robert Hughes to come to us uh, to share his message, Our Future Glory Awaits. Let's welcome Brother Robert Hughes. Good morning, everyone. We're going to be in the, in the book of Matthew. Uh, today is communion study at my home church. I know you had a communion study at a, a, pr a previous service here today. And when we have communion Sunday, Jesus told us, do this in remembrance of me. So I, I love to go back to, to Matthew and the Gospels to remember him and to consider why he died. Yes, to forgive our sins, but there's something else, and we're going to talk about that today. So we're in the book of Matthew, chapter 26. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to, to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Father God, we thank you for your holy and precious word, and I pray, Lord, you would press it, press it upon our heart, Lord. Have it dwell richly in us so that we may abide in it and follow you all the days of our life. If we should stray off the path by any means possible, draw us back to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> So I, I love to learn. I think many of us do. We, we enjoy learning. And I, I like it when the subject really grabs my attention because I think there's an art. There's an art to writing and teaching to grab someone's attention. Uh, I can remember sitting in lecture halls at um, the Ohio State University, huge university, 65,000 students, and I would sit in a, a lecture hall of 1,000 students, and uh, back in those days, I would sit up in the balcony, and I would marvel at how difficult that must have been for the professor to keep our attention. The subject matter is one thing, but there had to be illustrations and there had to be pauses and humor and checking in with with the audience. And I just thought it was incredibly challenging for that individual. And we know the ones that we liked, remember, and we know the ones that were, whoa, I'm, I was sleeping in the balcony. Well, there's other settings. Um, I, I lead small groups and, and you're you're many of you were involved in kingdom work. And you know how challenging that is to keep the group's attention on on the word of God. You've, you've got different personalities and you've got the shy and the very loud and you've got the sweet and you've got the rude, <laughs> right? And then you've got other people and I don't know how else to say it, but it's kind of who we are. There's some people who are very needy and they, they need to get things off their chest. And your job is to keep everybody's attention on the word of God. It's really, really challenging. And of course, um, we can all remember the way we dressed and our hairstyle of 30 years ago, 20 years ago. And if you're not there, you will look back on the pictures and go, oh my goodness, what was I thinking to try to grab someone's attention? So it, it is a challenging, and let's, let's be clear that Jesus wants our attention. He wants our attention. And, and it's been noted many times that the gospels reveal very little details of Jesus on the cross. And I think there's a reason behind this. If you've seen these blockbuster movies of today, I hear this often. There are so many fight scenes, so much CGI, so much thrown into that. 
that, that the young people will say, I kind of forget the plot at times. I don't even know what's going on. I, it's just fight scene after fight scene, CGI after CGI, and I just kind of get lost. What, what was the point of, of the plot of this movie? And I think in some ways, that's what's going on here with Jesus on the cross. Very, very little detail about his agony and suffering and, and any sort of blood or gore that's um, taking place because Jesus wants our attention for something so much greater than that. He wants to focus us on his future glory. That's where he wants our attention to be. Are we focused on him and his future glory? Uh, from the text that we just read, is one thing is clear that Jesus got the attention of Caiaphas, the high priest, absolutely grabbed his attention. And Caiaphas was the high priest of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is the Supreme Court of their day, if you will. And just look again, look at this, what he said. Caiaphas said, I charge you, Jesus, I charge you under the oath of the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. That is a direct question. That is a direct command. Tell us. And then, of course, Jesus says, you've said it yourself, Caiaphas. Nevertheless, I'll tell you again. Hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. I, I want us to understand that this is absolutely rattling the Sanhedrin. It, it made them stand straight up and go, what did he say? Because this is something that Jesus couldn't have claimed as a more powerful high position. He is literally going back to Ezekiel and Daniel who used these terms to reference the God most high. Uh, some look at these, these, these labels as uh, apocalyptic references, but what Jesus really is claiming here, he's claiming to be the redeemer. He's claiming to be the judge, the defender, and the Lord. He is pointing all of us and everyone in the Sanhedrin to his, his future glory. Now we know we know that Jesus wrestled in the garden just hours before. He wrestled, he shrank back from that cup, asking uh, the Father if, if he could just let that cup pass from him. Of course, the cup meaning the cross. But wh why? Uh, why did Jesus do that? Um, he, knew, he knew what was in that cup, for sure, and, and he knew what, what he was about to endure, and, and he knew it was so much more than just physical pain. But what Jesus was able to do to endure the cross was he understood th the will of the Father not my will, but thy will be done. And Jesus knew that the will of the Father was to exalt the Son. Jesus knew his position. This is how he endured the cross. He knew his position, his role, and he knew it meant future glory for the Son. But most importantly, I think Jesus also knew, Jesus also knew that all of those who came to him by faith and trusted in him would share in his future glory. And that's why he wants to grab our attention. That's what he wants to do and grab our hearts. Now, if, if you look at John 17, if you have your Bibles, I mean, I want you to understand why and how we can be so confident that Jesus really is pointing to his future glory and not just take this claim that he made in the Sanhedrin. John chapter 17, we call it the high priestly prayer. It's Jesus praying to the Father. And if you look at verse 22, if you look at verse 22, Jesus is praying to the Father and he says, I have given them the glory, praying to the Father, I have given them the glory that you gave me. We have a glorious future. We have future glory because Jesus has already given us the glory that God gave to him. Now, why did he do that? That's, a, I think, the most important here. Why did Jesus give us his glory? I want to give you three reasons out of John 17. In John 17, he's praying to the Father, I have given them the glory that you given to me. We have a glorious future with Jesus because he wants us to be brought to complete unity. I have given them the glory that you've given to me. I and them, as we are one, I and them and you and me, may they be brought to complete unity. John 17 verse 22. 
I and them and you and me, Father, may they, that's us, be brought to complete unity. And what Jesus is saying here is, is the reason for us sharing in the future glory is reconciliation. He wants us to share in his future glory is that we are reconciled to God the Father. Second Samuel, a great Old Testament verse, um, reads like this. Like water spills on the ground, which cannot be recovered, so we must die. That is not what God desires. Rather, he desires that we are coming back to him so that we are not banished from him, so that we are never removed from him. Second Samuel 14, 14 is this precious Old Testament verse that says, look, we are like water spilled on the ground. We're destined to die. We understand that. We understand we are destined to die. That's what sin has done to us. But this Old Testament verse points to reconciliation because it goes on and says, but God devises means so that the banished one, us, do not remain banished from him forever. So it's a glorious, wonderful, wonderful Old Testament verse that really points to what Jesus is pointing to us in his future glory so that we may be one with the Father, that we may be gathered up again with God the Father, that we are not, re, do not remain banished and swept away and, and destroyed, but God has devised these means to bring us back to complete unity. If you break this verse down in 2 Samuel, we are all like water destined to die. It's just a beautiful illustration for young people because if you pour water on the ground, where does it go? Always, always, always finds its low point. And that is you and that is me. I will find my low, low point outside of God. So we are like water spilled on the ground, destined to die. Now, if you think about gathering water up anywhere, the moment it's spilled out, it's already begun. It's already begun to evaporate, caught up in the world. Right? There's nothing you can do. Water evaporates. Then you take your little sponge or your cloth and you try, you try to gather everything up, but you can't. <laughs> Some is always left, little residue is left. And again, it's wonderful to tell young people this, by your own means, you can't bring yourself back to complete unity. The water is spilled, it's at its low point. The only way that we can be gathered back up to God is for Christ to die for us. And he gathers us back up and sweeps us together and allows us to be back in complete unity and reconciliation with God. So the first reason that Jesus is giving us his glory is so that we may be one with him and the Father and that we might be reconciled. Uh, the second reason that Jesus is giving us his glory, he's giving us his glory so that the world will know that he sent me and have loved them even as you love me. Again, this is in uh, John chapter 17, verse 23. Jesus continues to pray and he says, to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. If, if you write in your Bibles, and I encourage you to do, uh, that word even is telling us that God loves the Son exactly the same way he loves you and me. And that is so powerful that, that God wants us to know who he is in his future glory, that that we are not down here, we are raised up here with all the old saints, with Isaac and Abraham and Mary and everyone. We are one, and he wants us to know that he loves us just like he loves them, just like he loved Jesus. And, and that is a powerful thing to understand because that is who God is, not who we are. It is who God is. And he wants us to have this sense of we are pointed to our future glory, so that we can understand that God truly loves us like he loves his own son. And the third reason, the third reason Jesus is pointing us to his future glory is he said in verse 24 in John 17, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. We share in Jesus' future glory so that we may spend eternity in his presence. So these are 
powerful reasons why Jesus doesn't want us to be distracted by anything else that's happening on the cross. Sins have been covered by the blood of Christ. Now he's pointing us to his future glory, to make us one with the Father, reconciliation, to let the world know that God the Father sent Jesus the Son, and we share equally with Jesus and all the other saints and prophets of God's love. We are predestined, we are chosen as all they rest. And God gave us his glory so that we will spend all eternity with him. Romans chapter 8 uh, captures this beautifully. Romans chapter 8 tells us that that those he knew, he predestined for glory. And for those he predestined, he called, and those he called, they would also be glorified. We are known by God. We are predestined by God. We are glorified by God. And Jesus is calling us all by name. I know many people will say things like, wow, I just, I just want what I deserve, and it's very self-centered. I just want what I deserve, right? And, and I, I would just answer the question, no, you don't. No, you don't, because what we deserve is banishment and death. And, and God has devised means to, to draw us back if only we would attach our love and our faith to Christ. Those he knew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. And those he called, he will also glorify. So another important question is, yes, Jesus wants our attention. He got the attention of Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. He wants our attention so that we can be called to future glory. The, the other opposite end of that coin is, should we be working hard to get Jesus' attention? And I think the answer is no, no. And, and don't get me wrong, our faith should produce good works, and those good works will be rewarded in heaven. And it's important that that, that happens in our life because it is a mark of who we are as, as believers but we don't need to produce works in order for Christ to save us. That's the important thing. The Bible says he loved us before the foundation of the world and predestined us to future glory. And so we don't need to gain Christ's attention through dancing and works before him. He already knows our name. He's already predestined us and he's already glorified us and will continue to glorify us in heaven he knew us while we were lost he knew us while we ignorantly rejected him and when when he died we died with him when he rose we rose with him and we will rise again from the grave one day with him and all of that is is captured in the sense that jesus knows us and and we don't have to do anything to come to him. We can come to him just as we are. You know, there's many people who, who say, you know, the only thing that you can do to earn salvation is really the sins that you committed to get there. And that's what, that's what we bring to salvation are the sins. And Jesus, as we come just as we are, wipes away those sins. But I think there's, there's even more. If we could wrap our heads around letting go of this sense of good works produces salvation or works produces salvation if we could let go of that i think we could pay more attention to his future glory for example if if we could understand that um we no longer have to get his attention through all of this uh, producing of works then we could let go of all this guilt that plagues our life and our culture and we could focus more on his forgiveness and praise. Guilt is a powerful motivator, and it's, it's, it's infused in many religions, and we know that. But, but guilt isn't the reason Jesus wants our attention. What Jesus wants is for us to focus on him and to let the guilt melt away, to focus not on our works and our regrets, but to focus on all that he has done for us. And if that's true, if that's true, then we can forget about our performance and our focus and our relationship with other things, and we can simply step out in obedience. You know, we, we can stop reading the Bible just so that we said we read it. And I know so many people do that, uh, but we can begin reading the Bible or continue reading the Bible to know him, to know him. We can stop praying to be counted as if God's counting how many times we pray, um, but we can pray to know that we can count on him 
And that's an important difference. And finally, if we can kind of stop this culture, this, this influence of performance, then we can forget about how far we've fallen short and focus on how far we've come in the future glory that waits. We sometimes always want to bring ourselves down that we are these lowly sinners, and we are sinners. I'm not going to disagree with that. But we have to see ourselves high and lifted up because of what Jesus has done for us. And when we get to that position, that viewpoint, we can start to see the future glory that awaits. This is a very simple message, and, and it deserves attention to Jesus and what he's doing for us. I want you to consider, as I close, just consider the steps Jesus took to get our attention, because he was not passive. One, he stepped out of glory in a high position to get our attention. Two, he came to where we are and became man. And if I stepped out of this pulpit and just stood in the middle of all of you, you would immediately go, oh, what's going on? Why? Because I simply changed position with you and I got closer to you. It's exactly what Jesus did, stepping out of a high position and coming among us and dwelling among us and that changed the perspective of people then and today to realize that the God of heaven and earth came down to dwell among men. The third thing Jesus did is he called people out by name. He knew them intimately. And if I started calling people by name today, it would get your attention. I can still remember that in school. Robert, oh yes, I'm paying attention, right? We, we remember that. And so Jesus calls us by name. He knows us personally. He knows our background. He knows every thought that we have. And that is what Jesus uses to get our attention. And then Jesus, as he was dwelling on the earth, he actually touched people. He allowed people to touch him. And, and that created moments of intimacy where, where he used the power of touch to heal and to love. And, and I think that's another way Jesus uses his power, his glory to gain our attention to see who he was. We can all remember Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas. Ten of his friends couldn't convince him that Jesus had risen from the grave. And, and what did it get for him to believe? An invitation of touch. Go ahead, Thomas, touch me. Go ahead, touch me. And he just fell, my Lord and my God. An invitation of touch. What else did Jesus do? Jesus told personal stories. If I started telling you personal stories, it grabs your attention. If I told you the love affair I've had with my wife for 30 years, it would grab your attention. And Jesus did that over and over. He knew that stories and parables would relate to people for, for that generation, for all generations to come. If I went on to tell you something that was not flattering about myself, my alcoholic father and the abuse I was raised in, you might start saying, well, that's really, oof, you crossed some lines there. I'm not sure I'm really wanting to hear that. But isn't that what Jesus did? He came to where the sinners lived. He went to the people who were outcast. He dined with the tax collectors and, and people were just wondering, what is he doing? Why is he doing that? Because he wanted their attention too. You know, he came, he came for the sick, right? He came for the sinners. He didn't come for those who, who looked like they had everything all together. And then what if I, I went on and I said, you know what, that horrible story I just told you about my father, he came to Christ about 10 years ago. Boy, did Jesus tell things like that in his parables. And that gives us hope. And Jesus was all about hope and his future glory. All these things Jesus used in, in the Gospels, if you read them carefully, he used them over and over again to grab our attention. Because ultimately, that's what he wanted. Because the most significant thing that Jesus ever did with that was to, to leave us with this understanding that his death on the cross wasn't meaningless. It abolished sin and the power of sin, and it made a way for us to have a future glory with him, not just for a day, but for all eternity. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12 and 14 read this way, but when this man, 
this priest, that's referring to Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God because by one sacrifice, he is made perfect forever. Those who are being made holy. That's you and that's me. That's being made holy. Boy, that grabs my attention because that seems a long way away. But it's, it's the promise that we are being made holy. We are being made holy by one sacrifice, perfect forever. We are being made holy. And lastly, Jesus certainly got the attention of God the Father. Because it says in Isaiah 53, 11, after the suffering of his soul, that's Jesus, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. That God would be satisfied in what the Son came to do to live out the will of the Father. And when we understand it in that complete totality, we start to realize that Jesus' greatest desire was to do the will of the Father so that they may be one, but that we may be one with them. I think Jesus always had his future glory on mind and those who belong to him on his mind as well. And because of that, we can say, as Ephesians says, to the praise of his glorious grace, which has blessed each of us in the Lord Jesus Christ, today, tomorrow, and for all eternity. Amen. Father, we, we do love you, and we thank you for the promises we hold in Jesus. Every one of them, Lord. They were bought with a sacrifice, with blood that was shed, a body that was broken. We remember, Lord, and we want to cling to that. It is your death that leads to your, our future glory with you. May us hold tightly to that, Lord. May it cause us to reflect on the life we live now so that we may continue to grow and be more like you day by day. Amen.